So thank you. So my 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 kind of story will be controversial to Lauris in many cases. So we are after quality, not quantity. Uh, but to answer your questions, like at the beginning, is that in Estonia we have really clear kind of roles uh, in place. So Estonian Cyber Defence Forces Cyber Command is purely responsible uh, responsible for Ministry of Defence and its agencies and multilateral cooperation, and we use Estonian Information Systems Authority as our partner and also proxy to the private sector. So we try to kind of uh, avoid any duplication in the un entire ecosystem. Uh, just to kind of put a few things in, in perspective. First, we have to understand that what we are doing in the military is not through the uh, uh, prism of profit, but through the prism of defense, which kind of, uh, which, uh, asks us from different mindset when we kind of design the things. So we'll give you an example if we have a private company operating and, uh, and war happens, then they will say we have force majeure and they will discontinue their service maybe. In our case, we have to do vice versa. We have to expand rapidly and many times over. We have to provide quality services in this kind of contested um, environment. Cyber Command itself is not, it's not very old. It's, it was founded in 2018. But uh, Cyber Military Service, or Cyber Conscription, as we call it, is older than Cyber Command. So we started in 2012. And now I will kind of try to take you through how we do that. A friend of mine who is, I think, uh, also organizing the other, other event here, Are Intem, told me that Estonian, real Estonian man has to do three things. One is sing at the song festival, Laulubidu. Two, go to the mandatory military service, which is conscription. And three, ski Tartu Marathon, which is cross-country skiing, 63 clicks, uh, uh, classic style. Fortunately, he told me that at the time when I had done all three of them. So we expect Estonians to do the same. And I will kind of go through how we use the ecosystem uh, uh, to our benefit and how we also kind of uh, provide uh, our ecosystem back. So our ecosystem is perfect for uh, our kind of uh, recruitment uh, efforts. My own daughter, who's in kindergarten, can take an elective in robotics. Kids from the first grade can start coding through the Progger Tiger. This is a snap, uh, snapshot from, uh, from a website where there is kind of to all the different levels in, in to, until the end of high school, where you can learn STEM, technology, drones, robotics. Basically, people who are interested can already use this opportunity to kind of uh, educate themselves. Then we have uh, freelance, uh, freelance efforts, like a uh, friend of mine, David, does uh, uh, Unicorn Squad, basically teaching young girls STEM technology drones, they are capable of fixing drones, destroying drones, 12 to 16 years old, so really good from the youngster side. Then we have like today's competition, raise the awareness of that, that area. And, uh, and also we have a really good vocational education basis and also gymnasiums which have specific programs in cybersecurity which enables us to be basically present there, so to shape their minds, so if they want to kind of continue their career path in this uh, area, then it would only make sense, since for men, the military service are, is mandatory, they can choose to kind of continue their career in our, um, our command. And of course, the entire e-government and the uh, and the ecosystem that we have developed over the years uh, from the civilian side does help that, that we do have a really good understanding um, why this is so important. Now, moving on to the recruitment part. So, this is the difference now. We only take the best from the best. And uh, it goes through the testing. We have a company called Rangeforce who has provided us a platform to do kind of this uh, in-depth testing. Then we have our own tests, which finally kind of ends up with a interview with the current uh, or the new or coming um, uh, recruit. 
So to kind of see whether he or she kind of uh, fits uh, into our community. But we haven't stopped there just to kind of grab them from the market because they are kind of uh, forced to come to the service. So we are aiming for voluntary rate, which, uh, which is 100%, that 100% choose to kind of opt for service before they are actually kind of uh, uh, asked to come. Today, this percentage is growing. It's over 30. Uh, but uh, kind of e even into, if you want to get to this uh, cyber command, then you will go before you actually have been assigned to any units, you have to go and uh, take a test so we can kind of uh, make sure that you will continue as a, as a cyber person in, the, in this. We have even gone a step further. We have to done a, um, a uh, pilot project with one of the vocational education uh, schools in Estonia called Kehna. So where we actually kind of prepared entire class to come to our service. So basically we gave them this possibility to come there. And it's important because every vocational education uh, graduate has to go through a practical phase in their, uh, in their training, which is six months. So they can do this during their, um, during their service in, in the cyber command. So, and even from there, so we are also kind of participating in these kind of events uh, to kind of spot the talent and, and maybe kind of provide them uh, with an opportunity to come, uh, come to our service. Why is Cyber Command perfect place to start your career in cyber? So there is another friend of mine <laughs> on the picture. Uh, so why is it so good place to start? First, we, we cover a broad range of uh, areas. So we build system, we build software, we build hardware, we maintain them, we stress test them, we use them in really hostile environments, so where your average alien uh, gaming computer wouldn't kind of uh, survive. We take them out on the field. We break them and we defend them. So basically, the entire area of, uh, of different areas, what you need in the ICT field and how to understand where to go, then Cyber Command gives you a perfect opportunity to kind of uh, familiarize yourself. So we do, we do, uh, we provide the military and the Ministry of Defense all the networks. Uh, depending on classification, classified networks, official networks, we do cooperation with allies, uh, also networking. We provide all these services, whether it's on somebody's desk or whether it's in the middle of the forest. We also, also develop our own uh, software and tools. So this is another opportunity where you can kind of uh, train yourself. We have a cyber information operation center, which is uh, meant for defending our system from different perspectives, but also uh, pen testing our own systems. And this is, uh, this is one of the reasons why I would say that cyber, cyber uh, service, like mandatory cyber service in military, is a perfect starting place. You enter with pretty good knowledge, but we build those skills and uh, basically make you at least a specialist in some of the areas uh, where you end up. The usual career path is similar uh, to all. You start with the service desk, basically understanding the landscape that you're working in, and then you move into different areas, whether it's administration, whether it's uh, cyber defense, whether it's a service manager, whether it's a kind of documentation, whether it's offensive capabilities, defensive capabilities, and also we support information operations. And also one of the things that we have, uh, which is uh, not, not really common, is we have strategic communication center where people who have more kind of uh, artistic, uh, artistic skills can uh, also kind of do uh, media operations, uh, providing uh, kind of this kind of uh, uh, video feeds or, or even, um, or even kind of uh, give out journals. So now we move to the retention. So after this military conscription ends, some of the people will work for us, but this is up to 10%. The other 90% percent 
we are giving back to the community. Basically, we have trained them to be better. We have trained them to be uh, able to con contact with us. And we give them back to community. They will be working in Estonian Information Systems Authority, in all of these companies maybe that are behind me. But one thing is common for all of them. They are reservists of Cyber Command. So they are available for us also during the wartime and they know how to kind of uh, how to run business with us. So why is this important? Uh, the lessons from Ukraine is uh, quite obvious. Before the aggression uh, last, uh, last year, we saw how much cyber domain was put into play to destroy their command and control capabilities and also information uh, capabilities. So the government institutions were attacked, so they wouldn't know what to do. And uh, unprecedented attack against the, the satellite, uh, satellite uh, assets, which was a KSAT attack, sh was supposed to disable Ukraine's capability of, uh, of uh, command and control. So they wouldn't be kind of able to coordinate their counter, counter uh, activities. So this kind of shows that why we need to do this in the military. The other thing that is obvious from here is that in military, unlike uh, maybe in civilian sector, we always kind of consider these technological advancements as an extra layer for, uh, for speed or agility or kind of speed up over kill chain. We understand that uh, first we see it also in Ukraine, bullets and uh, Bullets and mortars are the primary kind of effectors, and everything else that comes with technology gives more more advantage. And we are kind of uh, willing to understand. We are understanding that redundancy is the most important thing here, and we have to be able to kind of fall back with every system. But civilian sector maybe doesn't have this uh, prerogative. So we have to train our soldiers from being soldier using wired communication, which is the old telephones, if you remember what those are, then uh, already radios, then already kind of uh, data networks, and then satellite networks, and so on, so, so etc. So the retention piece is uh, maybe most important because we don't lose uh, with our people connection after that they leave our, uh, our service. This is where actually the real work begins. So now we conduct exercises uh, quite regularly with different groups of our uh, reservists. Uh, the exercise which is shown here was uh, in September this year uh, called Baltic Blitz. It was an exercise where we uh, brought in our cyber operators. We had Polish cyber command operators and we had Maryland Air National Guard operators. So we trained those people who actually left us, maybe a few of them one year ago, two years ago, three years ago, we trained them again and basically taught them how we operate, what are our newest, latest standard operational procedures, what are our tactics, techniques and procedures. And these exercises go on and on. Uh, this was for the, uh, for the uh, cyber operations community. Then we had one in spring, which was for our ICT community, where we brought in our I, uh, ICT center reservists, where we actually put all these different connections uh, up over the Estonia, because we have to have our autonomous network uh, in any, every case. So basically, if the civilian network is down, like we had a few years back in Estonia, then we are capable of putting basically internet connection to any place in Estonia. And how to do that is we exercise. We rehearse this over and over again, that uh, when the worst case scenario would happen, then uh, our people who are in the reserve, trained as units, would be able to come in any situation and kind of uh, help, this, uh, help, this, help us to kind of... Uh, get through that. So the main idea is not to be late to the war. Uh, 
also this kind of exercises and uh, helps us to kind of maintain this community and uh, give back. The other exercises that we are participating is also the uh, Lock Shields exercise, which is the biggest uh, live fire exercise in the world, hosted by uh, Cooperative Cyber Defense Center of Excellence here in Tallinn, NATO. And, uh, and there we bring not only the military together, but also a lot of our civilian partners come there to kind of mix our communities and also kind of see what are the latest trends in, the, in there. And, uh, and while our people who stay with us in terms of retention get a really good training package. So basically not only the training that you get from the, your uh, universities, but also specific trainings from like NATO organization, from bilateral, like true bilateral agreements. So they, they end up as really good experts. So this is one of the benefits of uh, working with us, because like I said, our prism to that is security, not profit. And this is why one of many of the people who have uh, been with us went to the private sector, came back. Uh, we actually kind of uh, endorse, will support this kind of rotation, tell us that uh, wh what are the benefits working with us. Also, there's a huge possibility to kind of uh, go and work internationally, whether it's in NATO, whether it's in EU, in a kind of specialist, expert, and, uh, and leadership positions that we have uh, placed. Uh, place there today. So in a nutshell, this is kind of uh, how we do cyber conscription. And uh, I don't know how many of you have been to conscription here because we have international, well, I have uh, an international community, but definitely we don't talk about that much because we have a quite good kind of uh, flow of people coming in with uh, really good quality and who are kind of uh, staying with us for a longer period as well. So we haven't felt like too much of need to advocate or kind of promote this. And this is one of the first occasions that we do that. But I would say that definitely, if you have to advise any of the younger people or the youngsters uh, what to do with their mandatory service, then uh, cyber would be definitely option for them if they are interested uh, in this already. So. My own experience is uh, that if I go to the pri prior slide, so one of the guys who are kind of closer to you on the picture, so he was working for Estonian Information Systems Authority. Then he went to conscription uh, to Cygnus Battalion. Then he was in the NATO Cyber Center uh, COE. And uh, now he's basically, I think, almost organizing this exercise, or at least organizing exercise to different governments. So really good example, and he's still with us. This picture is from this year. So people kind of develop their skill set in the private sector and, uh, and uh, give it back to us. Now, if you don't have to go to conscription and you still want to participate in this community, then we have another way of kind of reserves which is the Defense League, and there is a Cyber Defense Unit. I will make it easier and say Cyber Defense League from now on. Where we have top experts who are joined paramilitary organization, kind of National Guard equivalent, who are also part of our reserve structure. So who can, benefit, who can kind of benefit from our training, but also they can give back, and usually they are people uh, who we wouldn't be able to hire and who we would be able to maintain because we don't have challenges for them. They are solving challenges for Microsoft, for, bank, for banks, for different companies and doing ICS and SCADA miracles. But they are willing to kind of put in their free time uh, to kind of support our endeavors. And it doesn't stop there. If you, are, if you don't want to kind of support the military part, then also this organization produces reserves to Estonian Information Systems Authority or the National Cybersecurity Center uh, as well. So this is kind of our way of contributing back uh, also to the civilian sector because military, civil, civilian military partnership is always kind of tricky to, tricky to handle. So the ideally we would see that over reservists would end up in the Cyber Defense League, but even if they don't, we will still manage them would, uh, would end up there, and this would be the central hub where we can manage uh, our new specialists and experts uh, in the pool that uh, 
cyber command with his allies has provided. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mikkel. Uh, I actually, I haven't been to conscription uh, because it's not compulsory for females. But I have to tell you my personal story. Uh, I used to work at the Defence Ministry, but before this I already knew uh, that it's possible to do that also in cyber field. And I actually, I was so sad about this that I didn't have that chance back in the time when I graduated high school. And, and I think also, if you would just bring it out the, the numbers, uh, how many females do you actually have uh, doing conscription in, in cyber? And, and do you feel like it's becoming more popular or how do we get more also, you know, just kind of gender equality in that sense? Because, I mean, if I think about conscription and if somebody would tell you that you need to be in a forest for the next nine months and, you know, just fight somewhere, I'd be like, no, not, that's not really for me. But if I would have a chance to actually do that in cyber today, it would be a big yes from my side. So, so maybe your perspective there, how do we get more also young females in that sector so that we are part of also the military sector a little more? So I would like to actually get your advice on that, how we would get more. <laughs> so we usually have like a couple a year who apply for that, but they usually end up in the, on the infantry side okay. because they like this military stuff, uh, at, at least for some period more. So we definitely would like to see uh, more, more people uh, kind of applying for this. Yes, the first two months, which is kind of the f basic training of a soldier, this is not too hard and it gives you at least a lot of skills which you can use later on in your civilian life as well. So basically I wouldn't be afraid of those two months because after that uh, for nine months uh, we will train you, exercise, train, exercise. So basically making sure that those skills are up to date and over, even our reserve skills are constantly up to date because uh, cyber, is, cyber training should be like pilot training in my head. So pilot learns all the basics, which is university, right? Your bachelor's degree, master's mm -hmm. degree. But pilot has to take test flights. Like they have to keep up their skills. And this is something that we do through the exercises. And it's really vital because there is no room for complacency in this domain because mm -hmm. everything is going so fast. All right. We received already one question also from uh, from the audience. And, and once again, uh, if you have a question, you can just raise your hand and I will uh, ask uh, the microphone to be uh, also uh, taken for you. So uh, there is a question. Uh, in your military exercise, do you also exercise with po uh, policing authorities? Uh, oh, yes. In that sense, uh, the... When we are in an exercise where we have civilian sector kind of involved, then uh, we basically give it directly to Estonian Information Systems Authority or our contacts in the, uh, in the police forces. So yes, we do that, but we don't deal it with ourselves. Mm -hmm. So the idea for us is, uh, like I said, no, avoid any duplication. So it means that we, if we see that something is kind of in other, other jurisdiction, we kind of hand it over because obviously when the crisis evolves, our troops are already focused on kind of how to expand uh, our own capabilities to make sure that we are we are not late for the war and we are kind of capable of supporting our troops on, on the ground. <laughs> there is a question asking, uh, but I, I'm pretty sure you can, you can give a, a good answer for that. Where is the base where you can speci uh, specialize in cybersecurity located? In, in uh, Estonia. Not, I, not sorry if you can yes. give the exact address for this, but... In Estonia and in Tallinn, to be more precise. <laughs> okay. Um, and there was actually a question before, I think it was was, uh, was for Lowry, but I'm actually trying to you know, just kind of change that question a little. What do you think about the role of AI in, in cybersecurity? When I, when I used to work at the Defence Ministry, we were investigating this lot, and when it comes to especially countries like you know, Singapore or Israel, mm. they're currently spending a lot of money uh, to really, again, raise their capabilities in, in order to use AI in cybersecurity. Do you think that also uh, one point, because also I, I could bring it out like US and China, mm. uh, but but uh, do you think that this is going to help us with the talent issue as well when there is a lot of, you know, AI use that is automi automized a lot of processes that like today, like the human beings have to deal with? So it's a double edge uh, sword. Of course, uh, machine learning. I haven't seen much of AI in this area yet. Mm -hmm. But of, of course, the machine learning uh, will enable us to do kind of uh, 
automate a lot of the stuff. But again, this is like I explained layers. This is another added layer. We still have to kind of be able to do it manually. And today I would say that we are looking for the private sector's kind of experience before we can actually kind of start trusting the system. This would not kind of maybe, do it, it would not so much enhance over uh, defense capabilities, like uh, cyber mm -hmm. defense capabilities, but would enable us to be more kind of, uh, more uh, agile with our services that we provide because like, defense networks are really kind of strongly protected so when it also comes with uh, some limitation to the services so in that sense we are eagerly expecting but in terms of detection then definitely this is something where we want to kind of uh, want to go but yes automation is the uh, is the big thing which the first uh, presenter also mentioned here that definitely if we are missing you said four million he said five million mm -hmm. so a lot of million people <laughs> so then uh, this is this is the key kind of element here absolutely and i think it's just like you're both so uh, as a continent like really needs to keep on investing in that sense as well so that we wouldn't you know miss a train when it comes to our competitors also like in in, in other states as well or just yes, compare that you, today. you can't be complacent in this area exactly uh, any questions from uh, from the audience any hands we we do see one hand here could we give a microphone for that gentleman there good morning um thank you for your, your presentation uh, my name is adrian venables i am the program manager for the cybersecurity program at taltech so an advertisement if anybody here wishes to do a cybersecurity masters please come and see me um <laughs> First of all, a, a, a comment. Um, it was great to have you uh, mention the Cyber Defence League. Um, I had 34 years in the UK military, and when I moved here, you very kindly recruited me <laughs> as an official supporter of the, uh, the Cyber Defence League. So I've swapped one ID card for another. Um, my, my sort of two or question and an observation. Firstly, with regards to recruitment, mm -hmm. all the tests you mentioned, do they look for people with aptitude or skills? Because there may be somebody who could be perfect, but hasn't quite got the skills yet. And do you identify that and then take them without the skills and give them the skills or with the skills? Yeah, so basically there's a balance. So we take some of the people who already have uh, like good skills and the kind of giving, we don't consider this giving back to the community. We are considering this loaning or borrowing from the community. Then there are people who don't have... Uh, uh, so good skills, but they have great attitude and basically capability of uh, operating. And this is what wh how we why we determine the kind of the, we take the last decision uh, with an interview, because we are actually looking team fit. We consider them uh, they are well we call them conscripts like officially, but we consider them from the beginning as our colleagues. So basically, we are recruiting them in our teams to make sure that uh, they will fit the, fit in the team and basically they would feel comfortable there as well. Because during the crisis, there is no kind of time anymore to start build, uh, building f uh, relationships and kind mm -hmm. of friendships. So this is kind of uh, how we approach that. So one and the other. Whenever. Thank you. Um, and my second point is really sort of an observation. One of my previous or last jobs in the UK military was to set up the UK cyber, def cyber defense reserves in the UK. And we recruited civilians with cyber skills, um, put them into uniform and trained them through and thought, this is, this is great. And then, as you said, we, we thought, this is fantastic. We now have this military cyber reserves when it all goes wrong. Mm -hmm. But of course, they all worked in the same industry in the civilian sector. And so the danger was that when everything goes hideously wrong, mm -hmm. the military call upon these people who are also fully employed in their day jobs doing the same thing. And so there's this danger that we think we're better than we are, but actually we regard the same person as having two full-time roles. Okay, this is a really good question. I will kind of go around answering that. So this is definitely an approach for a big nation, uh, well, as you would imagine. Uh, US does the same thing. So we have this kind of combined, uh, combined approach. So basically the people that we are uh, recruiting for the, for the conscription, for example, so they them we kind of mostly put into the teams. So basically, we develop their kind of personal skills, and kind of they are part of teams. Now, cyber defense uh, league that you mentioned, I was one of the founders back in two thousand nine. So they are providing us units in that sense. So basically, because we don't have so much control over those reserves directly, because during the peacetime they have this kind of control. 
And thirdly, we are basically making sure that none of our reserves are in a position where they are kind of uh, legally bound to stay in their job during the wartime. We kind of see to that. And lastly, not least, is we don't, cons we don't think that we have to bring our troops all together when uh, war happens. We have to make sure that we are able to contact them. Maybe somebody in Finland, Australia, in Germany is more useful me in some uh, cases than they would be uh, in Tallinn, Estonia, <laughs> whoever asked that, uh, at the same time. So you have to be kind of flexible and, uh, and we have seen kind of, we're trying, uh, testing both sides, the military kind of hierarchy and structure uh, and also this kind of flexible DevOps, which is, uh, which is kind of uh, uh, common in our structure. Uh, but at the end of the day, most important thing is that you're able to kind of uh, be in touch with these people. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Michael, for uh, your overview here.